to the Hannibal Lecter series, with the much more well-received prequel than the last film, Red Dragon. Like Silence of the Lambs, Lecter barely appears, which, considering how badly it went when Lecter was the focus in Hannibal, this should be a marked improvement. So let's begin. Unlike the book, which begins with Lecter caught by the authorities, for the film there is an additional backstory on the Doctor, as he tries to enjoy the orchestral music, but the flautist is terrible even to my ears, so God knows what it's doing to him. And if you remember Hannibal, you'll remember that Benjamin Raspail was one of Lecter's victims, and he was a flautist. So yeah, you can tell what's next. Lecter throws a lavish dinner party with the main course, a la Raspail, and he isn't particularly subtle about it either. What is this divine-looking amuse-bouche? If I tell you, I'm afraid you won't even try it. But the event goes off without further loss of life. Always a genuine concern at one of Lecter's parties. And while clearing away the plates, Lecter gets a knock at his door, opening it to find Will Graham, played by Edward Norton. He and Lecter have been working on the latest series of murders together, and Will needs advice before going to the Bureau with his latest theory. They both go over the case again, and Will's unsure of Lecter's most recent psychological profile, consisting of someone with a rudimentary anatomical knowledge due to the trophies this killer takes from his victims. This is the part Will has issue with, since he believes the killer isn't keeping the trophies, he's eating them, which naturally surprises Lecter. And I think it's this moment that defines the relationship between the two men, because you can see that Lecter is surprised, but it's more about him being surprised that Will figured it out. His response is perfectly Lecter in every way, as he doesn't panic or show any signs of discomfort that he's literally inches away from discovery. And Will feels unsure about the Doctor's abilities and wondering how he missed this new fact. Lecter blows it off as a simple mistake, but Will still isn't confident. Which is also something I think the Doctor engineered, because Will's gotten so dependent on him a lot to bounce ideas off, that when Lecter isn't so forthcoming, Will is pretty much lost. It's all just more parts of Lecter's long game. Lecter arranges to meet with Will and go over the profile, leaving to get his coat. Alone, Will finds Lecter's copy of La Russe Gastronomique, opening it at the bookmarked page, and finding a note of sweetbreads, which is thymus and pancreas, what Raspail had removed, as Will quickly puts two and two together, drawing his gun. But Lecter's one step ahead, stabbing Will in the stomach and forcing him to drop his gun. He assures his colleague it'll be a painless death, however. Don't resist. It's so gentle. Like slipping into a warm bath. Somehow, I think he was lying there. He lowers Will to the ground, telling him what he plans to do. I do admire your courage. Oh. I think I'll eat your heart. But Will's not going down without a fight, stabbing his attacker with arrows, causing him to stumble back. Will then pulls a gun from his ankle holster and guns Lecter down, as we cut to opening titles. Now, although not from the book, that little establishment of Will and Lecter's relationship helps the film overall. Because I saw Manhunter, which didn't have that, and it firstly made it quite confusing for a newcomer, but also there was zero connection between Will and Lecter. So, in this case, deviating from the book was a good move. During the film's opening titles, we look around the cliched nutty cave for our movie's big bad killer, which may be a well-established trope, but it is effective for learning about the antagonist, like how he's obsessed with Lecter, collecting news articles on him, which has the added effect of letting us know what happened with Will and the Doctor. We then skip ahead in time, with the film being oddly vague with the time frame of several years later, as Will is no longer an FBI agent but Jack Crawford is there with another case regardless. Crawford there being played quite perfectly by Harvey Keitel, and this version of Crawford is one of my favourites, this and of course Lawrence Fishburne. Keitel plays the character a lot less straight-laced than previously, he's much more street smart, and although he's not as clever as Will, he's clever enough to know when extreme measures are necessary, like bringing Will in on a case. 
Crawford is there to ask for Will's help in investigating this movie's killer, the Tooth Fairy. And what they know is that he's killed two families already, a month apart, in exactly the same way. Will downplays his own skills, but after seeing the photos of the murdered families, and given a time limit of three weeks until another death, he agrees to look at the crime scene. It's some serious emotional blackmail from Crawford, but again, like when he manipulated Starling into getting Lecter's cooperation, he's very good at getting results from people even when they're unsure of what they're doing. The ends justify the means because he gets results. Even if, yeah, it's not the best way for Crawford to treat his colleagues. So Will investigates the home of the first murdered family, the Leeds, finding the bedroom still covered in blood as he documents what happens. One big difference between the book and even Manhunter is that because Edward Norton plays such a good guy, Will Graham's unstable mental state and his insight into the killer's minds that leads him to catching the murderer is completely absent here. Like I said, for me personally, it's more a difference in adaption as opposed to a problem of storytelling. For this film at least, it doesn't detract from the overall experience. Back in his hotel room, Will's going through the crime scene photos, and one detail he returns to is why the killer put mirrors in the victim's eyes. But Will gets a sudden jump scare of brilliance. Because the killer placed the mirrors in the victim's eyes, there's a chance he took his gloves off, telling Crawford to fingerprint Mrs. Leeds' eye. Now, the way that Norton plays that moment of realisation is quite different to the book, and even Manhunter. Because originally, it gave us a glimpse into Will's mind, as he becomes the killer almost, and enjoys it to a certain extent, which is completely lost here. But again, it's not bad, it's just different. The next day, Will goes over the profile with what he knows, and most importantly, that this particular killer will not stop on his own. And elsewhere, Crawford is told that they did indeed find a partial thumbprint where Will said it would be. Outside the police station, Will and Crawford are met by tabloid rag peddler Freddie Lowndes, played to slimy perfection by the late great Philip Seymour Hoffman. And it's pretty clear who Will's still understandably pissed off at for taking pictures of him in the hospital after the Lecter attack. Later, Will and Crawford are sitting down for coffee, and Will is done with this case now, basically, because he feels he doesn't have what it takes anymore. But Crawford mentions a previous case. No, that, that stuff I just gave them was broad strokes. He's got no face to me. That's what you said about Garrett Hobbs, remember? Crawford mentions Garrett Jacob Hobbs, otherwise known as the Minnesota Shrike, a previous case of Will's. And this isn't really a compliment towards the movie, more the TV show because Hobbs plays a big part of it. And if you've seen the TV show before the movie, it certainly adds a lot of depth to these characters' backstories. Will says that he didn't figure out Hobbs, he was stuck with him, but he had help from Lecter. However, Will anticipates Crawford expects him to talk to Lecter, demonstrating my earlier point about how Crawford moves his people into the correct situations quite masterfully. So we then move to Baltimore Hospital, and the shot from the outside is taken directly from Silence of the Lambs, since they couldn't get their own footage of the place. And Will, once again, is talking with Chilton. But he's far from proud of his prize trophy. He's frustrated that he can't get anything from Lecter, who rather comically folds Rorschach tests into origami. Chilton wants some insight into Lecter, but Will refuses to help. And walking down to the cells, Chilton asks one last time for something on Lecter, but Will doesn't have the best advice. What was your trick? I let him kill me. Which is similar to when Chilton took Starling down there to speak with Lecter. It's all about how dangerous Lecter is and ramping up his reputation. Even with Frankie Faison in there, reprising his role as Barney, to give the whole thing this really neat continuity. But, I should say, it's also pretty unnecessary, considering the far more effective opening with Lecter. So Will makes that long walk to the doctor's cell, but this time Lecter isn't stood there waiting, since it's unnecessary to make an impression on Will. And just like with Clarice, one of the first things he does is identify the aftershave Will is wearing. Will compliments Lecter on a recent article, but annoys the doctor by referring to himself as a layman, since it took an exceptional individual to catch him. This small exchange is quite different to when Clarice spoke with Lecter. Firstly, because Anthony Hopkins is considerably older than himself in Silence of the Lambs, which is kind of unavoidable. But also, it's interesting to see Lecter try what he did with Clarice, as in get in her head, but have Will actually fight back because he knows how to deal with Lecter. 
Will offers Lecter books and potential computer access if he helps with the case, but also he tries to kowtow to Lecter's intellectual vanity, challenging him to prove he's smarter than the killer. Well, all that does is bring Lecter back to the question, Then how did you catch me? With Will giving his professional opinion. You're insane. Lecter then tries his usual tricks of analysing Will's life, pointing out he's very tanned, and subtly threatening him by commenting his aftershave is one a child would select. Lecter asks to keep the crime scene photos, but is refused, and also ignored by Will, who walks away when asked about his dreams. This exchange is very interesting to watch, because Lecter isn't dealing with a rookie. He's dealing with someone who knows what they're doing, and knows Lecter inside and out. So it's a much more even fight. And it's so strange to see Lecter actually on the defensive. Which is shown when Lecter has to shout for Will to come back. Will gives him the file, and gives Lecter an hour to look it over. And as Will waits, taking his jacket off, it's clear that he was much better at keeping his cool than it seemed. The fact that Will had huge pit stains because of nerves is a genius piece of improvisation from Norton, to show that even though he had the situation in hand, Lecter still understandably scares the hell out of him. The use of aftershave overpowered Will's nervous sweating, because he knew that Lecter would sniff that out. It just emphasises how well Will knows what he's doing. I never thought I'd see so much in sweat stains. Back with Lecter, he analyses the case notes, but just retreads the ground Will has already made. However, he does choose his words carefully, like calling the killer a pilgrim, which is part of Lecter's games, that'll come up later. Will needs Lecter's viewpoint, but is delayed by how the doctor smells his fear, before giving his opinion on how he was caught, stating that Will is just like him, as well as the new killer, which seems to affect Will deeply. And while leaving, Freddy Lowndes is waiting to take pictures for the tabloids, sticking to his slimy ways. And again, Lecter saying that Will is just like him is very central to his character. In the book. But the way Norton plays the character, you don't get any of that internal conflict. So yeah, when the dialogue highlights it, it definitely is a downside to the film. Will returns to the Leeds house and finds a home movie tape, thinking about what Lecter said that the killer would need a backyard and privacy. He follows up on this idea by going to the Jacoby house, talking with the guy repairing the door the killer broke through. Will asks why not use the other, more covered door, but learns it had deadbolts in, and when sitting in a tree that overlooks the house, Will spots a Chinese symbol. You're proud. You had to sign your work. This is personal taste, but one of the things I think was missing from Hannibal was that there was no actual investigation and detection, and I feel that's where these characters shine. So it's good to see Will going through the evidence and piecing things together. It helps define his character, and show how he deals in certain situations. Especially with Edward Norton, who's a damn good actor. And now it's time to see our killer, and this time he doesn't just have a nutty cave, he has a whole nutty house filled with items once belonging to his abusive grandmother, as we hear how she abused him terribly. If you ever make your bed dirty again, I'll cut it off. Understand? Now, yes, child abuse is a terrible thing, and I'm not surprised how it damaged our killer. But the way it's presented here is a bit too much for me. It's kind of like the director coming up to him and going, sympathise, sympathise, sympathise. It's asking the audience to think of the killer as more than just a monster, but really, that should be up to us, really. Especially as we haven't seen the guy yet. And when we do see him, he's wearing a mask, and also putting in his tooth fairy dentures, as he looks over his great red dragon journal, all about Lecter and himself and he's clearly not a fan of the name Freddie Lowndes gave him in the press. So the film asks us to sympathise while making the guy as inhuman and psychotic as possible, sending out contradicting messages and stopping us feeling anything about the character, not just sympathy. We return to Will and Lecter, and for some reason the camera work implies that Lecter is completely free, with an added scared look from Will. But really, Lecter's just getting some very restrictive exercise although I doubt it fooled you anyway. Will shows the red dragon symbol, which piques Lecter's interest, but he changes the subject to mention a piece of poetry. Perhaps if you could offer some insight. A robin red breast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. That will be important later. 
Will then mentions the bolt cutters and how the killer was going to use them, yet was uncharacteristically sloppy. But let's stop that for a moment to have a cartoonish jump scare. Have you never felt a sudden rush of panic? <laughs> Will then admits he'd have shot Lecter instantly if he knew then what he knows now when the Doctor attacked him. Which again, Lecter gets cartoonish at. You know, I believe we're making progress. And that's what our Pilgrim is doing. He is refining his methods. He is evolving. Am I the only one thinking that maybe Anthony Hopkins isn't taking the character as seriously as he once did? He's almost playing a parody of himself with the nonsensical accent he just did, or all the hissing and growling he does. But he did make a point of saying that this would be the last time he would play Lecter, and sadly his disinterest shows. After Will and Lecter's talk, he's placed back in his cell and given a chance to speak with his lawyer, whom Lecter immediately hangs up on. And then, somehow, by using the phone's hang-up switch, he's able to make an outside call, and he manages to charm a secretary into giving him Will Graham's P.O. Box address, which can't be good. Back with Will, he's gone to a library to investigate Lecter's cryptic poetry, Robin Redbreast in a Cage. It turns out to be a poem by William Blake, and while going through his bibliography, he looks through some of Blake's paintings, which is when he comes across the Great Red Dragon and the woman clothed in sun. This is a pretty confusing part of the book, which both Manhunter and this film interpreted differently. Because the Great Red Dragon paintings are a series of four different paintings by Blake. The Great Red Dragon and the woman clothed in the sun is the first and the one used in the film. But in the book, Harris names the second painting, the Great Red Dragon and the woman clothed with the sun, while describing the first painting. It gets pretty confusing, especially when the movie makes the exact same mistake. And the Brooklyn Museum, who should know better, labelled the in painting as the with painting. So who the hell knows anymore? Without warning, we move to Francis Dollarhide's workplace that restores and transfers films. Dollarhide is very softly spoken and timid, especially when speaking to a blind female colleague, Reba. And the fact that we saw the Tooth Fairy and Dollarhide at separate points emphasises the almost split personality he has with himself, and who he's becoming, the Red Dragon. Honestly, when you see the shy, unassuming Dollarhide, you begin to sympathise, making my point about the blatant plot dumping before being unnecessary. Outside the building, Dollarhide gives Reba a ride home, and she invites him inside for some coffee. Dollarhide studies Reba as she cuts a piece of pie, and how she deals with her blindness, yet Reba brings up the elephant in the room, of Dollarhide having some kind of soft palate facial repair, understanding his shyness about it. You can see it builds mutual respect between the two, as Dollarhide considers himself inferior, but is challenged about this. It makes him feel he doesn't need the Great Red Dragon, but for someone as unstable as Dollarhide, it later causes great mental conflict. Back with the investigation, Crawford tells Will that a letter has been found hidden in Lecter's cell from the Tooth Fairy. Will devises a plan by pretending there's an electrical problem to prevent Lecter returning to his cell so they can retrieve the letter to analyse it. And they do indeed find a hair fibre and teeth marks. And there's something pretty funny about all this. I don't get it. Why not just throw the whole note away? It was full of compliments. Couldn't bear to part with them. That part is rendered quite comical now, mainly because in the TV show, that particular plot point is openly mocked by Lecter himself. How do you imagine he's contacted me? Personal ads? Writing notes of admiration on toilet paper? Because, yeah, it does seem pretty silly that Lecter would be so insanely vain for no real reason. And it shows how much balls the TV show had to break the status quo. And after inspecting a part that was torn out, they find that Lecter is responding to the Tooth Fairy in the personal section of Freddie Lowndes magazine, The Tadler. Once that's done, the letter is placed back where it was found. Unfortunately, Lecter spies latex gloves sticking out of a janitor's pocket. And he shows his skill at exploiting people's mistakes, since this detail allows him to figure out the whole plan. Lecter's response is found because he calls the Tooth Fairy Pilgrim, which he's used before. However, the message is written in a coded form, using a book as the cipher, so they won't know what the message says until the paper runs. One of the analysts suggests drugging Lecter to get the information, and Will then gives my favourite line. They tried sodium amytal on him three years ago, trying to find out where he buried a Princeton student. He gave him a recipe for dip. 
I love that line. Firstly, because it's pretty damn funny in a very dark kind of way, but it also shows how mentally strong Lecter is. That not only do drugs have no effect on the guy, but he's also able to fuck about at the same time. It really adds to his mystique. The analyst has a list of the books in Lecter's cell to decode the letter, but the message has to be run to encourage the Tooth Fairy to make contact again. And using a copy of La Rousse Gastronomique, the analyst figures out that the code is Will's home address, and to kill them all. Will rushes off to his family when Crawford tells him, but he's already taken care of the situation, quickly getting them the hell out of there. Which is pretty damn proactive for this kind of situation in this kind of film. Back at the bureau, Freddy Lowndes was caught trying to get pictures of the victim's bodies, so he's still as slimy as ever. However, instead of arresting Lowndes, Crawford decides to use him to their advantage. So Will gives Freddy the exclusive on the Tooth Fairy, telling him everything about him, which is all actually false, and designed to piss off the Tooth Fairy as much as possible, like how he molests his male victims, and calling him a loser. So he'll try and attack Will at the apartment that's been set up as a trap for Dollarhide. Freddy is loving the details and unbelievably pleased with himself, but little does he know how much this is putting him in the Tooth Fairy's crosshairs. Which, the FBI should know that. And yeah, the guy's a prick, but still, at least warn him. And that morning, Dollarhide has picked up the paper with the interview, intimidating the guy selling them while he does it. And unfortunately for Freddy Lowndes, Dollarhide has decided to shoot the messenger, kidnapping Lowndes from a car park. Lowndes soon wakes up, now stripped down to his pants, and quite literally glued to the wheelchair he's in, which is added salt in the wound of being kidnapped. Unless Dollarhide decides to pour salt into the wound, that is. He tries to keep his eyes closed, but Dollarhide wants him to witness everything about his transformation, by first showing him the iconic back tattoo of the red dragon Dollarhide has, and then horrifying Lowndes by showing him slides from the murders. He then admits he lied in the papers and wishes to give Dollarhide the respect he thinks he's owed. I am the dragon, and you call me insane. But fear is not what you owe me, Mr. Lowndes. You owe me all. Ah. Oh. I get it. Sorry. But I should say that this scene really shows off Ray Fine's acting here as he's able to play the character quite brilliantly, being able to move between the timid Dollarhide and the confident dragon quite seamlessly, but never taking it too far where you can't tell it's still the same person. It's a very difficult balancing act, but Fines does it brilliantly. Plus, I think this was good practice for when he played another reptilian-based psychopath. Dollarhide has prepared a statement which Lowndes reads into a tape recorder, and asks them to be freed, but Dollarhide has one last thing to show him. But he isn't finished there, because after the face biting, Lowndes is then set on fire and rolled down the street. Wow, Dollarhide takes criticism almost as well as your average YouTube commenter. Crawford, Will and the team listen to the tape, understandably horrified by it. But then it's back to business, as Crawford orders them to catch the guy. So they figure out that he's in the Chicago area, has a big truck, and has access to the antique wheelchair. But Will is sceptical they'll find anything of worth. So against his and Crawford's better judgement, Will returns to speak with Lecter, because he might have seen something Will overlooked. And Lecter congratulates Will on his first murder, so he ups the ante by telling Lecter to give Dollarhide a chance to succeed where he failed in killing him. He reluctantly accepts, giving nothing but the bare essential psychoanalysis. Yet Will just wants to know how he's choosing the women, to which the doctor gives a cryptic, you looked but didn't see. But he asks for a few more conditions before he reveals anything further. And after the brutal murder, Dollarhide takes some time out with Reba, as she mentioned that she still remembers seeing a cougar before she went blind. So Dollarhide takes her to a zoo where they have a tiger sedated for her to touch. Back at Dollarhide's place, Reba makes sure and counts her way from the door, setting things up for the climactic scenes later. And for Dollarhide, it's very fortunate that Reba's blind because he watches a tape of his next victims, ominously telling her it's about some people he's going to meet before she helpfully gives him a blowjob and sleeps with him. It's a very intentionally uncomfortable scene, and I doubt many could find it arousing. It's also a very bizarre scene because Reba has absolutely no idea the kind of psychopath she's with. 
But what I think is key here is that Dollarhide isn't trying to trick her at all. He's just being himself, and he's not being the dragon. And that conflict is shown quite literally when Dollarhide wakes up and has to argue with the painting, not wanting to give Reba to the dragon, and even resorts to putting a shotgun in his mouth. Dollarhide puts the shotgun down when he sees that the painting is at the Brooklyn Museum. And Ray finds this truly brilliant here, taking what could have been a really goofy scene and turning it into something pretty painful to watch and experience. And after giving Reba a ride, he tells her he has to go away and she needs to leave, which seems heartless, but you can really see he's trying to protect her. Back with Will, he's been given the first family's personal effects to see if something connects them with the second family. He goes through the whole movies trying to figure out what Lecter meant by him looking but not seeing, and while he tries to understand, Dollarhide has gone to the Brooklyn Museum to see the Blake painting. And back with Will, he finally sees something on the tape he remembers that Dollarhide had bolt cutters for a padlock, but the door was changed before the murders, so Dollarhide must have known the inside of the houses too. And then Dollarhide gets to do what he's at the Brooklyn Museum for, as he quickly knocks the curator out, and then starts to eat the Blake painting. Which, in his mind, makes sense, I guess. He's destroying and absorbing the dragon, so he may take control. This is him trying to stop killing. And then there's an unintentionally hilarious scene. Now, is it just me having a really sick sense of humour, but that... is pretty fucking hilarious to me. Crawford's making calls to see if anyone had access to the house, but Will sees that the Leeds dog had no collar, yet Dollarhide knew which one to get rid of. Will finally realises that it's through the tapes itself how Dollarhide knew the houses, so they're quickly on a plane to his place of work, getting a fax about the incident at the museum. And at the film company, Dollarhide shows up, but he sees that Will and Crawford are already there to find him, which forces him on the run. And in the office, Will gives a brief description of what the killer might look like, and at the mention of facial disfigurement, the manager names Dollarhide. But hey, at least he's trying to stop killing now. Well, that is until he sees a co-worker kissing Reba on the cheek. He might be quite the jealous type. Yep, I'd say so. Dollarhide then knocks Reba out, kidnapping her, and takes the guy's body back to his house. She wakes up to an extremely paranoid Dollarhide, believing she's why the FBI have found him. And then he goes full on crazy, saying the dragon wants her, as he dumps gasoline all over the place, while shouting at the dragon. He tells Reba he'll shoot her before himself, setting the place ablaze. Up until now, Dollarhide's red dragon side has been very clever and mindful. So it's such a strange, sudden heel turn in his personality to see him go completely mental like this. But perhaps that's actually the point. And I think Dollarhide may prove more cunning than he seems at the moment. Dollarhide can't bring himself to harm Reba and just shoots himself instead, splashing Reba with blood in the process as she finds his body. Reba's earlier step counting lets her remember her way to the door and she's met by Will outside just as the whole place explodes quite spectacularly, pretty much ending everything with a bang. In the hospital, Will is talking with Reba, telling her that it's not her fault, and that she couldn't have known about Dollarhide, speaking from experience with Lecter. And outside, Crawford hands Will Dollarhide's journal, and even he admits to his wife that he sympathises and feels sorry for him, being made a monster through years of abuse. But back at the Bureau, Crawford is told the body found isn't Dollarhide, but the guy he's shot. So, much like when Crawford realised Clarice was in danger, now it's Will and his family and Will discovers that one of his mirrors has been smashed knowing Dollarhide is there. He takes a knife for protection, and upstairs his son's held hostage with a piece of mirror, forcing Will to drop the knife. But Will quite cleverly uses what he found in Dollarhide's journal, shouting at his son for wetting himself, mirroring Dollarhide's grandmother's verbal abuse, causing him to attack Will by slashing him across the chest. But Will sticks the knife in Dollarhide's leg, managing to get away and arm himself. Will's wife comes up the stairs, and ordering her down, he shoots through the door, hitting Dollarhide, but also being shot himself. And while seeing if he's alright, Will gets his wife to shoot Dollarhide in the head, several times, just to make sure. And the film ends with Will reading a letter from Lecter, telling him he's still thinking of him. And then there's this little ending moment. Hannibal, there's someone here to see you. Wants to ask you a few questions. I said you'd probably refuse. A young woman... 
What is her name? Which kind of implies that Silence of the Lambs takes place almost immediately after Red Dragon. So either the film doesn't explain the situation very well, or it's got its time frames all messed up. But anyway, that was Red Dragon, and my god, it's a hell of a lot better than Hannibal was. I said this before, these films are, in my opinion, a lot better when there's an overarching murder case to solve. It allows the characters to stand on their own, and not just play second fiddle to Lecter's character. Cause you have to admit, he overpowers anyone else he's in a scene with. Which is not necessarily bad if you balance it right, which this film does quite well. Ray Fiennes plays a great villain in this film and is able to play the different sides of the character perfectly. And I think I said all that needed to be said about Norton's portrayal of Will Graham. He's more straight-laced and rational than most other portrayals. But again, for the most part, it's not bad, just different. So in the end, Red Dragon is a very entertaining watch that's a bit more interesting and action-filled than Hannibal, but lacking a lot of the subtlety and psychology from Silence of the Lambs. And yes, that is the last time Anthony Hopkins played Hannibal Lecter. And he went out pretty well, honestly. But next time it'll be Hannibal Rising, which is a controversial book as well as film. So much so that most fans don't even consider it canon to the series. But more on that in the next video. So until then, see you next time.